Yeah, they're on the road. All right. Welcome to the uh, first Saturday Science Lecture of the term, first of four. All of these are going to deal with Arthur Compton and his legacy. I'll be talking about the Compton effect at 100, or maybe it's a better name, the centennial of the Compton effect. My name is Eric Henriksen. I'm a faculty member in the physics department. Uh, my own research has very little to do with Compton, so it's been kind of fun to dive into uh, learning about these things. Um, Again, a little tour of what I've learned. Um, of necessity, in an hour, I can't cover nearly everything associated with this topic. I'm going to try to give you just a nice overview of Compton, uh, you know, who he was, what he did, why it was important, what was the status of uh, the knowledge of light before he came along and demonstrated wave particle duality, not to throw out spoilers, but that is what Compton did was provided the first hard experimental evidence for this notion of wave particle duality, that there are objects that can have phenomena that is both wave-like and particle-like in their behavior at the same time. And we normally think of these as uh, disparate symptoms, but in fact, they can exist in the same thing. Uh, when Compton came along and did his work, it was very much in the air of the time. There were many people working on these topics. It wasn't just Compton. Of course, I'm going to focus on this works. There we go. That handsome devil. Uh, because he's important to us because he did his work actually here at Washington University. In fact, just 100 years ago, this month is when he took the data that I'll be showing you at the end. So this is really the proper time to be talking about it. Uh, Compton spent uh, Compton came to Washington University twice in his life. He was here in uh, 1920, 1923, in his first round as a young man as the chair of the department. Uh, and then that's the time during which he made this great discovery that eventually won him the Nobel Prize. University of Chicago took a look at that and snapped him up, took him away from us, he went up to Chicago, where, among other things, he oversaw uh, Enrico Fermi building the first uh, nominally controlled nuclear reaction underneath the uh, football stadium there, where they decided that wasn't such a great idea, <laughs> sent it out to New Mexico. Uh, but he stayed up there for a while and was involved in the Manhattan Project, uh, which will be the topic of another Saturday Science Lecture, I think, next week. Uh, before he returned here in 1945, as chancellor of the university, remained that way for a number of years, eight years or so, before stepping back into just a distinguished professor position in the physics department, and then earning my favorite title, professor at large, uh, for the last year of his life before passing in 1962. So, I'm going to tell you about Compton, where he came from. We'll talk about, yes? Someone on the Zoom chat says that you're not sharing slides. Can you share that screen again? Oh, really? I am seeing them on my computer, said so Ann Miller. I see them on my computer. Whoever is not seeing them, maybe classic, try restarting Zoom. Uh, it seems like some others are seeing them. So, yeah, please try restarting Zoom, and I hope that'll work. Uh, this will be recorded. And, or is being recorded, and so worst case scenario, you can download it later with apologies. Okay, so on to Compton. In the picture of the Compton family in 1908, uh, Arthur Compton is there on the left with his sister Marie, mother, father, two other brothers, Wilson and Carl. Uh, this was, they were from Ohio, from Worcester. Father Elias was the uh, dean of the University of Worcester. It was apparently quite an academic family because at some point, uh, right after World War II, uh, while Arthur Compton became chancellor of this university, Carl Compton became the president of MIT, and this fellow Wilson was the president of what then became the Washington State University system. So this was a powerfully academic family. It's been something in the water or else, you know, great training from this fellow. Uh, I also exhibited signs early on of what I would think of as a uh, classic uh, experimental scientist in training. He was very good at building things. He built this just a couple of years after the Wright brothers. His own front plane. 
That's Arthur Compton there. He built this triplane and managed to glide in it nearly 200 feet, scaring the bejesus out of his parents, who convinced him to stop these activities. And in his, uh, in one essay, he says, yeah, I took it apart and burned it, sent it off with a bonfire Viking style. That's too bad. But this he did at the tender age of 17, not too shabby. <clears throat> This one I find particularly amazing. As an undergraduate at the College of Worcester, he published not one but two articles in the journal Science. This is a forefront scientific journal in the United States, not the world. Uh, as an undergraduate, to publish a solo article in Science Now would be amazing. It was no less so back then. What did he do? He measured the rotation of the Earth with a small little hoop, glass hoop filled with water. Even with the comparatively crude apparatus described above, however, it is not difficult to show that the Earth revolves. This has nothing to do with x-rays, but I thought it was really cool and demonstrates his experimental uh, capabilities, so I thought I'd talk about it a little bit. Basic idea is, here's the pictures of the actual apparatus. This is a glass tube, much of which is thermally insulated except a couple little parts that are exposed so you can take a look with a microscope at the water that is inside this tube. And there's a little bit of oil in there, shake it up, oil breaks up into droplets. So you could watch those droplets move. So what does he do? My cartoon aspect here, here we are in the Earth. Earth is rotating. Here's this water-filled tube. So if you're standing over here in Ohio, holding the tube in front of you like so, that's going to be the relative uh, orientation of the hoop to the Earth. Okay, now stand the hoop up like so. All right? And consider what's happening as the Earth rotates. Technically speaking, the top of the hoop is rotating around in a circle that is larger than the bottom of the hoop. This is greatly exaggerated. Excuse me. And because it's rotating in a larger circle and completing the circle in the same amount of time, the top of the hoop is moving faster than the bottom of the hoop. So you have the hoop like this, and then you quickly flip it upside down. And once I do that, the actual material of the hoop continues moving in those circles I had just drawn, but the water inside maintains its momentum for some amount of time. It's relatively frictionless and keeps moving. So the water that was moving to the east before, when it's flipped upside down, now moves relatively to the west. And with the little microscope, you can see little oil droplets moving past. So not only qualitatively could he work out that the Earth was revolving, but he was actually able to make quantitative measurements good enough to put good to hard numbers to this as an undergrad. I, I put that as a challenge to the undergraduates in the room. <laughs> Solo scientific article before you graduate, science article. Anyway, oh yeah, and here's the microscope you would use again to actually look at those little droplets and count them as they go by, and you could work out how fast they were going, therefore how fast the Earth is revolving. Thus prepared, uh, and with some exposure to uh, the then forefront burgeoning science of, of x-rays, uh, he had an x-ray apparatus at the College of Worcester that both he and his older brother Carl would play around with. Both of them went off to graduate school at Princeton, Carl first, Arthur a few years later, and they, played, they worked in the lab of this fellow Richardson, uh, and on equipment somewhat like this, I'll go into details about this equipment in a little bit. Uh, this is basically apparatus for measuring x-rays. And uh, this is from a paper that uh, Compton published in 1916. This is some of his data that I'm not going to talk about too much. It's not particularly relevant for us today. Um, just to say that he was thrust into the forefront of x-ray science in graduate school, uh, following the steps of his brother and even working with them. So x-rays were forefront stuff, I and mean, they're still very useful today. Mike Novak will tell you about this in a few weeks. Uh, but at the time, figuring out what x-rays were was occupying some of the best scientific minds of the time. The very first Nobel in 1901 was awarded to Willem Rengen for discovering x-rays. And these were, well, they were called Rengen rays for some time. Then in the ensuing decade, or so, so he actually discovered them in 1895, got the prize in 1901. The ensuing 10, 15, 20 years, people were trying to figure out what these things were. Uh, by virtue of how x-rays were created, uh, launching high-energy electrons into a piece of metal and outshines x-rays, this was similar to ways that people knew how to produce light from materials. And so there was a sense that x-rays had some relationship to light. 
but they tended to do strange things. If I shined x-rays through a gas, you would expect light waves that would cover the entire system would interact with all of the gas molecules, and that's not what was observed. In fact, they would only interact with a few of them, as if x-rays were coming through like little particles. So it's all very confusing, uh, and <laughs> contradictory evidence in different directions. Things started to shake out in the mid-1910s, 1918 or so. 1914, Max von Loewy won the Nobel for demonstrating diffraction of x-rays off of crystals. I'll talk a bit more about this in a moment, but for, for now, let me just state the diffraction of x-rays is or diffraction of anything is very much a phenomenon demonstrated by light. It's a wave-like behavior. Along comes the Bragg team, father and son, both named William, uh, who then won the Nobel for using this to explore the nature of crystals. And they demonstrated how you could use crystals to understand the energies of X-rays, actually do spectroscopy on X-rays. 1916, Charles Barclay also wins uh, for something less relevant to what we're talking about today, but the characteristic x-rays emitted by different kinds of materials. Point being, lots of Nobel activity here, figuring out what x-rays were was really occupying quite a number of people. And this is the, you know, 1916, the paper I was just showing you from Compton, 1916 is when he published that, so he's really jumping into the thick of all of this. Okay, so using this thing, what is this then? A zoomed in view of it. We can talk about each of the parts. It'll help to understand what these are in order to understand what Compton does later on when he's here. So first, also the most important in this, we have a source of x-rays. Uh, Compton and others would tend to use something called a Crookes tube. I stole this image from Wikipedia. Crookes tube is more or less a glorified light bulb. It's a glass bulb with some pieces of metal inside of it put a large electric potential between these two pieces of metal and you launch electrons from here to here or they stack into it and outshines x-rays into the rest of your apparatus. Uh, notably, Compton built most of his own. He naturally, being a good experimentalist, uh, became an accomplished glass blower and would make his own because they were better than anything he could buy. I really appreciate that. Down here is the first means of detecting x-rays. So we're gonna bounce x-rays and we'll show you momentarily from here to here. Uh, this is an ionization chamber in which we can detect x-rays. I'm showing a, a version of one. We actually use things like this in our lab to measure pressures. But the idea is that there's a gas inside this, also a glorified light bulb. When that gas is hit by x-rays, they become ionized. The electrons are knocked off of some of the gas atoms and you can detect that as an electrical current. The more x-rays coming in, the more current you get. And it's a way of just measuring the intensity of all the x-rays that come into this tube. Here's a pretty picture. Somewhat ironically, this is um, an x-ray of an ionization tube. Pretty stick it in your x-ray system. That's what you get. Some sort of Ouroboros, if you will. Over here, okay, it's connected from the ionization chair. How do you measure the current? Well, you plug it into something called a four quadrant electrometer. Here's a fancy drawing of one. And here are two of them right in front of me. These ones are rather old. Uh, you can tell by the tarnish on them. I've taken the lid off of one. I tried to take the lid off of this one, but someone many decades ago dripped wax all over it. And it's very hard to pull apart. But afterward, you're welcome to come down and take a look at these things. You can shine a light in here and say, see that on the inside, it's still nice and shiny. And if you want to see a much nicer looking one, there's a display case over in Oldham Library right now celebrating Compton, and that's where we put the prettiest one you know, on display for everyone to see. What are these things? <clears throat> they're very sensitive means of measuring electrical current. Uh, it's missing on this one, but normally there should be a very fine wire hanging through these four pole pieces down here, and you can use the pretend you attach a mirror to it, and as the electric potentials appear, a mirror will shift so that light from here will bounce from one place to another and shift around depending upon the uh, uh, amount of electrical current coming ultimately from the ionization tube. I should note, these were very sensitive before Compton came along. Then he and his brother, jointly together in grad school, published a paper in which they made them even more so. They were able to measure down to a femtoamp, which is a very small amount of electrical current. In fact, most of the equipment in my lab isn't, possible, isn't capable of doing that. I said that we don't need to do it quite as much as maybe Compton did. So. You can buy things to do femtoamps, but at the time that was an enormous advance. Finally, the light shining off the electrometer goes to what is more or less basically film. Um, 
perhaps the younger folks in the audience won't know what that is, but everybody else will play around with metal. But anyway, it's film. So the point is that you could measure the intensity of x-rays and have a means of recording it and sharing it with everybody else. Here's the heart of the system. Right in the center here would be a crystal. Say, calcite would be icon. In fact, I bought this and had it shipped the second day, and it got here just in time. This is a crystal of calcite. After you want to come down and play with this thing, it's pretty cool. It's got a strong birefringence, meaning if you put it on some text, the text will double. Anyway, it's got nice crystalline planes, I'll show you in a moment, that are useful for interacting with x-rays. It's a piece of calcite. So what you do, stick the calcite right here, and x-rays come out of your tube, bounce off the calcite in kind of a mirror-like fashion, and go on into my ionization chamber. The angle of incidence here is the same as the angle of reflection, and we'll go into this in more detail in a moment, but the important part of all of this is that the wavelength of the x-rays that are reflecting, this lambda here, that wavelength scales with the angle of reflection. So you can actually choose which wavelength or which energy of x-rays are reflecting off of my calcite crystal by rotating, changing this angle. And you can actually rotate this thing. This whole thing sits on a rotating table and can move around. So you can change the angle of incidence and reflection of those x-rays. So this is the whole system together that folks like Compton would play with, try to understand exactly what these x-rays are, sourcing them, passing them through different materials, bouncing them off of different crystals, and seeing what they ended up with. <clears throat> Catching the transcription, it's uh, so far not too bad. Oh yeah, sorry, summary of all this. X-ray source, X-ray detection, X-ray spectrometer, wavelength scales with the angle reflection. <laughs> <laughs> Among other things, they're trying to figure out what light is. What is light? It's a question that people had asked for a long time, and I'm going to quickly rush over several hundred years of history, going back to Newton, and the notion that light is nothing more than a stream of particles passing through. So here's some picture of Newton, you know, with the prism shining light on things. And back in his day, mechanistic viewpoints were all the rage, largely due to Newton's activity. And you can see, okay, Newton didn't have a laser yet, whatever beams of light, I have a laser. A little bit easier. So if I take a mirror, take a laser beam, you can see that I'm <laughs> bouncing a beam of light directly off this thing. And if I change the angle of incidence, I change the angle of reflection. Angle of incidence and reflection are the same. This is a very simplistic viewpoint, but if I take a super ball and bounce it off the surface, you see more or less the same thing. It comes in at an angle, bounces off at roughly the same angle if I'm able to do this without, it's a little harder. I have to make sure that this thing isn't spinning too much. But anyway, you get the idea that if you're thinking about particles bouncing off of things, it's very easy to take that picture and extend it to light that's bouncing off in very much the same fashion. So thus Newton becomes a fan, a proponent of the so-called corpuscular theory of light, that light is composed of all these tiny little particles moving through space in a straight line. And one of his other arguments is if you think about waves, waves don't naturally just move in straight lines. Go to a pond, sit down at the pond, put your hand in it, do this action on the pond on top of the water, what are you gonna see? You're gonna see waves propagating out from your hand in a circular fashion. Those waves are going in all directions. They're not just propagating in one direction. So you can see how it'd be easy for Newton to take this particulate point of view. That only lasts until maybe the early 1800s or so. Thomas Young performs an experiment by shining light through two slits and discovers something really remarkable. So what I want you to think about is, if I have a sheet and I cut one long slit in it, I take a handful of sand and drop that sand onto that slit. Some of it's gonna fall through the slit onto the ground below and I'm gonna have one little pile of sand. Fine. Cut two slits, take that handful of sand, Pour it on there, let it fall through. I'm going to get two little piles of sand. Keep going. Three sits, three piles. You get the idea. How shocking would it be if you did that? Poured sand through two slits and discovered quite a number of little piles appearing on the ground below. That would be completely counterintuitive 
And yet that is precisely what Thomas Young was able to see by shining light through two little slits. He got quite a number of little patterns of light appearing, and this is actually Thomas Young's sketch. Here are the sources of light spreading out in circles, and those circles interfere to produce patterns of constructive and destructive interference. That's an experiment you can do back at your pond. Take two hands, do it like this, so you've got two circles radiating out, and you will see the interference pattern when those circles begin to overlap. Or you have a laser pointer. And some very finely made little slits. Try to do this so I don't blind anyone. You'll blink before it hurts. Let's see, there we go. So you can see a pattern, an interference pattern, multiple regions of bright and dark light when I shine this laser through two finely spaced slits. I just did in two minutes what Thomas Young probably took years to accomplish, but you know, I have my advantages. Clear demonstration of diffraction of waves, demonstrating that light is a wave-like phenomenon. That more or less clinched the story. Although a number of years later, people are experimenting with, you know, what is the electricity, what is magnetism? Maxwell comes along in 1861 and writes down a bunch of equations, which I'm not going to bother you with, but from which he's able to derive that light is an electromagnetic. Someone is requesting control of my screen. Nope, declined. Sorry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> from which he's able to derive that light is essentially co propagating electric and magnetic fields traveling through well, the vacuum, will ignore any issues of an ether, uh, and propagating at the speed of light. And ever since Maxwell and Thomas Young's demonstrations, it was very well understood. Everyone got it. Light is a wave like phenomenon. Get diffraction, interference effects, and you have the math book to back it up. You're good to go. There we are. Okay. <clears throat> this brings me back to the people who were trying to understand what x rays were and exactly what this calcite crystal is doing for us. Any crystal, calcite in particular, is going to be made up of a regular array of atoms that appear in planes. So the uh, little, uh, the largest uh, blue spheres there are meant to be all the calcium atoms. The smaller red and gray dots are the uh, carbon and oxygen that are at the lattice work supporting all the calcium atoms. And I could draw a series of lines like this. In fact, I could draw these lines in any number of ways through this pattern. You can just see for yourself. I could have drawn the lines this way or whatever. I'm just picking out some set of regular uh, 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 lattice planes there just to make them visually apparent so we can figure out what happens when x-rays bounce off of the, this calcite crystal. You might imagine you have one beam of light that comes in like a wave, bounces off like a wave, sort of end of story. Angle of incidence is the angle of reflection. So far, so good. But in fact, when we're shining light, the light, the wave fronts of the light are covering a lot more area. So I'm going to draw a lot more of these. In fact, I should have drawn even more, but I'm tired of this, so you kind of get the idea. So here's the incoming light wave with all of its peaks and troughs in phase with each other. All the light waves go up and down at the same time. That's representative of the strength of the electric field, if you will. And then they're going to bounce off these planes of these. Uh, planes of atoms inside whatever material we're working with, with calcite, and they're going to reflect off. And for the particular angle I've chosen here to demonstrate, these different uh, uh, light waves going out are not in registry with each other. Some of them are going up when others are wiggling down, and on whole, these are going to interfere destructively, and there's actually going to be no light reflected at this angle. I might choose a different angle, though, for which the incoming and the outgoing light rays are all in registry with one another, demonstrating constructive interference of the waves. And now I'm actually going to be getting some light shining off of the crystal. There's a particular equation that could describe this right in here just for fun. This is the wavelength of the light lambda. D is the distance between these planes of atoms in my material. And there's an equation that relates the two. We don't have to worry about the details too much, except you can see that the wavelength increases through the angle. That was a sine function, but we can mostly ignore it. Thus, the X-ray apparatus that Compton was using had at the heart of it 
the wave-like behavior of x-rays so that people were really beginning to understand it. Yeah, x-rays really are just another form of light. It's a higher energy, smaller wavelength, but otherwise it's just like visible light. Does the same thing. Incidentally, you can show this sort of behavior, this fine diffraction behavior, if you don't have uh, something like this with the tiny little slits in it, you can just grab a laser pointer, which most people have for playing with cats, and a CD, if you haven't switched to entirely digital bit, this is digital, but anyway, on a CD, there are all these little pits that encode the information. You can observe diffraction quite easily in the safety of your own home. Look at that. I hope I'm not shining this into anyone's eyes. I don't get just one beam bouncing off, but there are a number of beams where the light interferes constructively, just as if it's coming off of a crystal. It's the same sort of phenomenon. Easier to do at home. All was well until this came along, the photoelectric effect. So through the 1800s, it was well understood that light was a wave-like phenomenon. Things started getting a little screwy though when people started shining light onto metals and looking at what happened. First of all, if you shine light onto a metal, there's some light coming off. I'm not showing that here, but it is actually happening. But in addition to the light hitting the piece of metal, I've got electrons coming out. Well, that's interesting. Must be that some of the energy from the light coming into the metal is being transferred into the electrons, giving them a boost, giving them some kinetic energy so they can fly out of the material. People begin exploring this, and they find that they can more or less make a plot like this, where you're plotting the kinetic energy of those electrons coming out as a function of the frequency of the light. And you get a linear relationship between this. The higher the frequency, the more energy there is in the electrons. Also, interestingly, there's a minimum frequency needed in order to get any electrons out of the material. The frequency here corresponds to the color of light. So if you shine more red light, you have electrons coming out, more blue light, you get electrons. You go back to what is known classically about light behaving like a wave, and you try to understand this phenomenon. What would classical physics tell you should be happening? It tells you that the energy of those electrons should increase with the light intensity. The brighter the light, naturally, the more energetic the electrons should be that are coming out of the material. The brightness of light corresponds to the stronger electric field in the light itself, stronger electric field should accelerate my electrons more, it all makes sense. When I think of light as waves, the energy must be distributed through those waves. So if I turn on a light source, here come the waves. It's gonna take some time for enough energy to build up in the material to launch an electron out. So there should be some kind of time lag. Turn on the light, and then the electrons come out. Make sense? There should be no dependence on the color of the light. The energy is entirely bound up with the brightness of the light. All you need is brighter light. It doesn't matter the color. You might have to wait longer, but you just crank up the brightness of your light, you'll get more energetic electrons. All of this is wrong, as it turns out. When you actually go and do the experiments, you find that the energy, as I was showing here, actually increases with the frequency. If you crank up the brightness of the light, you will get more electrons coming out, but they will all have the same energy. Their energy doesn't depend upon the brightness. There's no time lag. No, people tried. No one was ever able to see. Turn on the light. Wait some time. Electrons. No. Turn on the light. The electrons come out immediately. Immediately. There's no time lag. And as already mentioned, <clears throat> In fact, the energy clearly depends upon the, upon the color of the light. All of this was wrong. This was confounding. There were lots of interesting theories put forth that I won't go through about trying to make classical electricity and magnetism correspond to what was happening in the lab. Mm, you know, it's, experiments are hard. You didn't get a line exactly like this initially. And so there was some what looked like progress or not, a lot of back and forth. No talk on physics of light around this time it would be complete without mentioning this guy. Of course, Einstein has to show up. <clears throat> Einstein comes along. He had a very good year in 1905, as you may be aware. <laughs> he had a very good year in many of those years, actually, if you look at his publication list. But anyway, 1905 was particularly good. Uh, came up with special relativity, explained the Brownian motion, the random thermal motion of little particles in liquid. And he also wrote a paper about the photoelectric effect where he said, hey, guys, Here's the answer. I know what's going on. He says, what if light 
is remember that Newton guy who was pretty smart. Remember, if we think of light as little photons and we associate a certain amount of energy with light as being little particles, not waves, think of them as particles. He puts forth this quantum relation, the energy of each little particle, uh, energy packet, things we refer to as photons these days. What if the energy is equal to some number, Planck's constant, but set that aside, some number times the frequency of the light. Here comes this little packet of energy, goes in the metal, transfers that packet of energy entirely to an electron, gets that electron out of the metal. He's able to derive an equation. The kinetic energy of those electrons should be equal to the energy of the incoming light minus some offset. All right, that's where you get your minimum frequency needed. That's the minimum amount of energy in this picture to kick an electron out of the material. If your photons don't have that much energy, you don't get an electron out. If they have just that much, I'll get an electron that moves a little bit. Crank up the frequency, crank up the energy, you'll get an even more energetic electron. It's a very nice picture. It well explains everything in the photoelectric effect. No one believes him. Einstein. No one believes him. Got to qualify the statement. No one believes him, sort of. This fellow and others are intrigued by Einstein's work, and also the photoelectric effect is a problem, so they continue working on it. Robert Milliken goes and builds an amazing piece of equipment he refers to as a machine shop in a vacuum. So he's able to make a very clean metal surface in a vacuum and then shine light on it and look at the energy of electrons coming out. And this is data from his paper. Those little circles are his actual data. This is a plot of, uh, well, it's the volts versus the frequency. It's more or less the energy of the electrons versus uh, the frequency of them, like the plot I was showing you before. His data are those little points and he draws this nice straight line through it. It's beautiful. Kinetic energy is linear in that frequency, just precisely as Einstein was predicting. He wins the Nobel Prize for this in 1923 for his work on the photoelectric effect. Beautiful work. What does Millikan think of all this, though? <clears throat> Words from the very same paper that this data appears in. Yet the I love how these people write. Nobody writes like this anymore. Yet the semi-corpuscular theory by which Einstein arrived at his equation seems at present to be wholly untenable. Despite then the apparently complete success of Einstein's equation, this equation, the physical theory of which it was designed to be the symbolic expression is found so untenable that Einstein himself, I believe, no longer holds to it. Clearly he was not in regular contact with Einstein. <laughs> Einstein publishes a paper the same year, 1916, doubling down on this and saying, oh yeah, my picture's right. Photons are right. I don't know where Millikan's getting this. 20 years later, Millikan would write a textbook in which he said, oh yeah, back in 1915, I was one of the first supporters of Einstein's photon theory. <laughs> As a funny aside, just because Millikan's fun to make fun of, Millikan was a, a wonderful experimentalist. But he had some issues with truth. So he writes a textbook, different one, 1905, in which he shows a picture of J.J. Thompson, the guy who discovered the electron in 1895. Here's the original photo of J.J. Thompson hanging out in his studio in, in England. Here's the picture that showed up in Milliken's textbook. I don't see this. It's good. It's good. Cigarette. <laughs> Apparently, Milliken didn't like smoking. <laughs> Original photo, JJ's hanging out with a cigarette. Photo in his book now. <laughs> Hold a Stalin on it. So, Milliken, great experimentalist. Maybe you don't trust him beyond that. Okay, back to the whole photoelectric effect thing. Uh, Millikan confirms Einstein's equation so well they give him the Nobel Prize, but he just absolutely lays waste to the notion of the photon. It's like, that is wrong. Einstein wins the Nobel for, for that equation, for that linear equation, not for special relativity, not for anything else, but for the photoelectric effect. And yet, nowhere in the citation do they say anything about the photon. So they're kind of silent on that, but they're like, oh yeah, you got the, you derived the equation, right? We just think you didn't get the, you know, your reasoning behind it is, your motivation is wrong. Niels Bohr wins the Nobel for developing um, kind of the old quantum theory of uh, 
the first quantum model of an atom, mind the details, but he wins the Nobel. Uh, in his Nobel speech, he says, in spite of its heuristic value, referring to Einstein's photon theory, the hypothesis of light quanta, the photon, is not able to throw light on the nature of radiation. Something will find there. Nobody believes it. <clears throat> Niels Bohr gives this talk 10 days before Compton publishes his data, nailing down wave particle duality, demonstrating precisely that Einstein's photon picture works 10 days before. Uh, okay, back to Compton. <clears throat> what did Compton think of all this? Compton was very much confirmed believer as anyone would have been at the time, in the classical picture of light, light as waves. And he was uh, so committed to this and a fairly talented uh, mathematician, in addition to being a good experimentalist, um, that he really stuck to his guns in some amusing ways. So here is the classical picture of an X-ray scattering from an electron. I have an electron in some material. Here comes my oscillating electric field. This is my light wave, my X-ray comes in and these the electric field is going up and down and up and down, and that makes the electron go up and down and up and down. And a wiggling electron like this radiates light. So here's a little gif I found of uh, a plot of the electric field intensity coming off of a wiggling electron. And you can see that uh, mm -hmm. there's a couple important points here. Uh, one is that we're, we're, we're getting this oscillating electric field. So this is radiation coming off of the electron. Two. The light being radiated from this electron is going equally in the forward direction and in the backward direction. It doesn't really care what direction the X-ray came from. Wiggling electrons just going to radiate in two directions. In, incidentally, it doesn't radiate straight up or down. If you're looking at a point-like particle and it's going up and down like this, you actually can't tell it's moving. So it's not radiating towards it. If you look at it from the side, oh yeah, I can see it moving. Great, I see the light coming out from it. Three, most important thing, whatever the wavelength of the X-ray, whatever the energy of the X-ray coming in is, that is the wavelength or the energy of the light going out. No change in energy. As usual, how these things happen, the data says something else. So in this time, people were starting to collect data on X-rays and gamma rays fired through materials. Any material contains some kind of electrons in it, so the X-rays and gamma rays interact with those electrons. The classical expected picture is that the X-rays should come out evenly from the material in both directions, forward and backward, relative to the direction that the X-rays came in. This is a gamma ray data. So this curve here, this is from a paper by Compton, this curve here is the intensity of the light as a function of the angle of the incidence of the X-ray. So here's the forward direction at zero degrees, here's the backward direction at 180, and the distance from the origin is the expected intensity. So you can see there's some variation. What does the data tell you? The data is the little circles. Virtually all of the scattered radiation is in the forward direction. Very little bit backwards, most of it forward. It's completely unexpected. How do you deal with this? If you're Compton, sit down, you think about it for a while, and you come up with a great idea. Remember this notion of diffraction we were talking about, that when I shine light on something, there are particular angles in which the light will want to go? Turns out, if you say, forget the idea that an electron is a tiny little particle, let's let the electron be like a ring, a thousand times larger than any electron I would have expected. So something on the order of, well, I'd put it sideways like a picometer or so. Let the electron be a hoop. Then when light comes in and scatters off, it will diffract in just such a way as to make most of the light scatter in the forward direction. This solid line here is the prediction of Compton's theory, assuming electrons are little hoops. Fits the data wonderfully. You may have massaged the size of the electron to make that happen, but hey. Further experiments happen over time. Compton shows this data in another paper. Hmm. The data points you're seeing here are of uh, lower energy X-rays than the ones that were over here. And at these lower energies, you can see that relative to the origin here, there's actually a fair amount of X-rays being scattered in the backward direction, as you would expect. The classical picture for even amounts and forward and backward is this line here. You can see it fits the data very well over most of the range, except for these data points out here. 
And assuming you believe those, then you have the same problem. There's an excess of X-ray scattering in the direction that the X-rays are coming into the material. Undeterred, Compton comes back to this and says, well, in order to make this one work, if you assume a spherical electron, but very large, nearly as large as an atom, it will, again, diffract light in just such a way as to fit the data. This solid line is Compton's curve. So he's really trying to find a way that somehow electrons and materials can work together in just such a way as to scatter the x-rays to match what's being observed and be understood from a classical perspective. This is more or less where he's at in 1919. <laughs> He'd gotten out of grad school and he went to Ernest Rutherford's lab in Cambridge. He worked there for a couple of years, kind of marinated in the currents of the time and you know, talked to people who were on the continent and kind of really got a sense of what was going on. And then he came here. Why did he come here? He was pretty well known at this point. And he could have gone just about anywhere he would like. He spent some time at Princeton, he had offers from other places. He came to Washington University, which he said, in his own words, was at the time a kind of small out of the way place. I think we're a little bit more than that now, but back then he came here, he became chair of the department and on his way here, on the ocean liner, he penned this, these notes, there's actually several pages of them, problems to be tackled at St. Louis. What am I going to do? Here I am sitting on the ocean liner. I got a month to get them. Scattering of radiation of various hardnesses up to hardest obtainable with Snook outfit. That was a kind of source of x-rays. And then he sketches something which should be familiar to you from the diagrams before. Here's an x-ray source of crystal fractions happening. Here's the ionization uh, chamber for measuring those x-rays. Hopkin was aware by this point of the notion of a quantum relation. He was dimly aware, maybe I, no real evidence that he had read Einstein's papers, but people were talking about these kind of things. And uh, there's one paragraph in these notes, if relation one, that's an equation I'm not showing, is verified for very hard x-rays at small angles where the excess scattering occurs, problem I've just been showing you, it will show that the different electrons in the atoms cooperate so he was looking for some sort of cooperative effect of all the electrons, and therefore that all electrons are effective in scattering, and that the quantum relation does not enter. So he's trying to find a way to, he's got this gene picture that works in some regimes. It's like, how can I make this apply across the board so that a classical picture can explain everything we're seeing? <clears throat> okay, he gets here. He's actually not in this building. This building didn't exist at the time. Actually, Crow did. The building named after Compton did not exist for obvious reasons. Uh, he was actually over in Eads Hall in the basement doing these experiments. He sets this up. Uh, it's actually a little bit different from what was sketched on those notes. Uh, in particular, what he's trying to do here, he's got a source of x-rays. And this stuff over here is all the same I showed you before. A crystal for doing spectroscopy of the x-rays, some way of detecting those x-rays. But the first thing he does, it, remember, scattering is the problem. There's too much scattering of x-rays off of the material. So he makes this critical decision to do something nobody had done before, which is not just measure the total intensity of x-rays scattered, which is what was in those plots I showed you before. Instead, he says, we're going to take a look at the spectra of the x-rays. We're going to see how they scatter as a function of their energy. This was the key idea. This is what eventually broke everything open. How does he do it? He's got this piece of graphite here. It's actually shown very small <clears throat> so that the x-rays come up from the tube, scatter off of the graphite, and he's looking at the x-rays that scatter off at 90 degrees. There's nothing special about 90 degrees. It's just an angle he chose, and later on he measured other angles. But for now, he's setting this up looking at the x-rays that scatter at 90 degrees relative to the x-rays before they hit the graphite. So he's going to compare those two. What is the energy spectrum of x-rays before the graphite? What is it after they scatter at 90 degrees? <clears throat> this is the actual equipment he used. Um, the x-ray sources in here, this is a giant lead box. Okay, by this time, they knew that it wasn't necessarily good to bathe yourself in a lot of x-rays. So they have this little box, this little hole you can't quite see. Uh, this thing here is where the calcite crystal is. This is the ionization tube. That thing right there 
one of these things, a little electrometer, you can see it. And this whole thing is mounted in such a way that you can rotate it to do the spectroscopy. So that's his actual equipment. I don't think we have any of this equipment left anymore, unfortunately. What does he measure? He measures this. Here's his data. This is what he's able to use to show that X-rays behave not like light waves, but like little particles. I'm going to go into some detail about this, but I just wanted to show it to you first. <clears throat> it's a beautiful set of data. Of course, this is not the first thing he measures. And of course, it's not what he understands immediately. It's kind of fun to think about because no, no scientist goes in the lab. So I'm going to measure this thing, and I measure this thing once, and I get the answer, and I'm done. Uh, it never happens. <clears throat> yeah. What does he do first? This is his first set of data. And he publishes a little note about this in uh, the Finland Review. It's barely a page long, contains no plots. And he says, I've observed a change in the energy of x-rays. What did he really observe? Note that this is not, oh yeah. Sorry, zoomers, yep, okay. I'll try to do this both. So <clears throat> this is the data, first set of data he takes. But note the author of this is not Compton. The author of this is Stewart. Roger Stewart is a emeritus professor of the history of science at University of Minnesota, who's literally written the book on the Compton effect. Um, and he spent a lot of time going through uh, Compton's notebooks and noted that the data that Compton was using, this data, Compton never actually plotted it. So far as we can tell, he never published a plot. There's no plot in his notes. There is a table of the data, and if you look at the numbers in the table, you can make the same mistake that Compton did, which is that he assumed, clearly if you look at this, you see in both of these, the same trace shifted relative to it, right? So you can see that one of these, the solid line is shifted to next to the, the dashed line, and the same thing in his original data, there are these two peaks that look very similar to each other, but one of them is shifted, and that shift tells you that it has gone to lower energies. This is a plot of, uh, where's my arrow here? Against glancing angle, and remember higher angle is higher wavelength and lower energy, so both of these plots are showing you that the scattered x-rays are coming out at lower energies. Compton made the error, however, in looking at the table of data in his notes, of thinking that these two peaks we're the same peak at the same energies. They're very close to each other. There's some experimental error. He assumed they're the same thing. And he thought that this peak over here was actually the shifted peak. It's an enormous shift. It's a huge increase in angle or in wavelength, huge decrease in the energy of the x-rays. And so he published this in a note saying, yeah, I've seen this big change in energy. How did he explain this? <clears throat> he said, an incoming x-ray hits an electron, that electron takes up all that energy and it recoils, it goes very fast, some significant fraction of the speed of light. And just like when an ambulance comes by and you hear the sound of that ambulance change as it passes by you, that's a Doppler effect. Doppler effect happens with the emission of light from a fast moving x-ray as well. Never mind the details, but if you happen to be standing over here at 90 degrees to it, you're going to see that the wavelength of the emitted x-ray has changed. I'm showing some of the numbers over here, but it doesn't really matter. You can, uh, you can calculate the change in the wavelength and Compton conserves the energy in this interaction. Says all the energy coming in from the X-ray goes into the kinetic energy, one half mv squared of the electron. So HF is the energy of the incoming X-ray and all of it goes into making the electron move. Turns out, you do the numbers on this back of the envelope, you can actually explain why this peak would show up here. This is essentially the outgoing x-ray was at lower energy, Doppler shifted there. It's not right, but it was a nice first try. <clears throat> Within a few months, Compton had a better set of data, the data I'm showing you on the left. Once again, the original x-rays before they hit the graphite are the dashed line. The solid line is the x-rays that come out at 90 degrees. And you can see clearly that these are just the same spectra. One is shifted relative to the other. Once Compton did this, he actually plotted this data and he published it in the Bulletin of the National Research Council. 
he'd been tasked with uh, writing a review of the status of X-ray science at the time. He immediately realizes his mistake when he plots the data. It's very clear that these two peaks in the center here are not at the same energy, that one of them actually is shifted relative to the original one, and that the relevant change in energy of the X-rays is just a few percent. It's just this small shift from one to the next. How does he explain this? With recourse to the Doppler picture again, X-ray hits an electron, electron goes fast, the light coming out from it is Doppler shifted. Um, but in order to get the numbers to work, he says, we're not going to conserve energy, we're going to conserve momentum. So he writes down that the momentum of the elect recoiling electron is its mass times its velocity. And this thing here, Planck's constant over the wavelength, is a way of assigning momentum to a light wave. He does that, the numbers work out surprisingly well. Uh, there's just a few percent change. He actually writes this down. The observed change is 3%. The calculated change is 3.5%. That's good agreement. I would take it. He publishes this. Within a month, October 1922, 100 years ago now, he realizes his mistake. And he publishes this paper in the Physical Review. It's the exact same data. He didn't take any new data. But the text off to the right has changed as he gained a new interpretation. By this time, he had written down a quantum theory for the scattering of X-rays off of light, which assumes that the X-ray comes in as a little photon, as a localized packet of energy, and scatters particle-like off of an electron. He calculates the shift in the wavelength, 0.024 angstroms. His measured shift is 0.022. Again, that's pretty darn good agreement. I'd go with it. But I'm going to show you he's abandoned the Doppler picture at this point. <laughs> And written down precisely this picture. This is actually from his paper as well. It shows the incident quantum. This is the incoming X-ray. It hits an electron. The electron recoils, now flying off at some angle. And the scattered X-ray goes off at another angle theta with lower energy than it had, having transferred some of its energy to the electron. In this picture, he conserves, for the first time, both the energy in the interaction and the momentum, just as you would do if I had two balls hitting each other on a table. I calculate the incoming energy and momentum of each and calculate the outgoing energy and momentum of each and conserve the totals. That's what he does here, applying Einstein's picture of a photon and deriving this formula for the change in the wavelength. It's Planck's constant over the mass of an electron times the speed of light times the one minus cosine theta, where <laughs> theta is the angle of recoil of the X-ray. This is the Compton effect. That in scattering an X-ray off of an electron, sometimes the X-ray will give up some energy. And because it gives up energy, it changes its wavelength. It becomes a longer wavelength bit of light described by this equation here. Let me ask a question. So sure. if you've got your crystal there, when you bounce x-rays off the electrons, you've got photons in there too. Do the photons influence this? I, I mean, the, the photons are what's being influenced. I should note that there's a bigger picture of scattering going on here that not all the x-rays undergo an interaction like this. Many of them scatter without changing their energy. In fact, you can do that with this, and anything that's scattered off of this an angle is going to have the same energy. Come back to it. So you have both elastic scattering where you don't lose energy and inelastic, this process where you do. Okay, legacy of this effect. Uh, Compton's discovery hit physicists like a storm. This was very much in the air. There had been 20, 25 years of trying to figure out how x-rays behaved. And Compton was not the only person working on this problem. If he hadn't gotten there first, someone else would have within months. Uh, in fact, there was a fellow, Peter Dubai, he was a theoretical physicist, who wrote down a more general theory of the quantum scattering of x-rays uh, before Compton published it, uh, told his experimentalist friend, hey, I found something, you should go measure this. And, the experiment, and this was actually two years before Compton did his work, and his experimentalist friend was like, eh, I'm busy, do other things. That was a Missed opportunity, shall we say. Um, anyway, there was 
no denying Einstein's photon picture after Compton's data came out. Within months, all of the preeminent physicists of Europe were talking about this amazing discovery by this American kind of in the middle of nowhere. He won the Nobel in 1927 for his discovery of the effect named after him, along with this fellow Charles Wilson, who uh, got the Nobel for developing the cloud chamber, which is a way of visualizing subatomic chambers. Pretty cool. This discovery directly inspired Louis de Broglie, theorist. Um, incidentally, Louis de Broglie's brother was a celebrated X-ray physicist in his own right. In fact, if Compton hadn't made this discovery, Marcel de Broglie would have. He'd already had this notion that this quantum, that this picture of Einstein's was correct, but he had just hadn't written it down in public yet. But his brother, inspired by this notion that light, <laughs> hitherto considered just a wave, could also clearly have particle-like behavior, maybe things that we firmly consider to be particles, like electrons, could show wave-like behavior. And he puts that idea into his PhD thesis. Einstein loves the PhD thesis. And uh, this idea, just a few years later, was resoundingly confirmed by Davison and Germer in this paper here, where they scattered electrons now, not light, but electrons, off of a crystal of nickel. And you can see that for different angles, that the, uh, uh, that the electrons were scattering off of the nickel, and for different energies, there was a particular signal at some angle, that same angle that the light came in with, where they saw the electrons coming out. Clear evidence of electrons behaving like waves. Um, Davison went on to win the Nobel. I don't know why Germer didn't. His name's right there on the paper. Um, but the other person who won the Nobel along with him was George Thompson, the son of the cigarette smoking man from before, who did more or less the same experiment at the same time in, in, in England. And so they won jointly, and Germer was just left out in the cold, I guess. And of course, from here, these ideas directly inspired Schrodinger, Dirac, Heisenberg to develop the final modern theory of quantum mechanics in the late 20s, 1926, 1927, <clears throat> all driven directly by Compton's discovery of this wave particle duality. With that, I'm going to leave you with a few things. Bibliography, first of all, I've had a lot of fun reading into this stuff. These are the, probably the four main references I've used along with a lot of the original papers. Roger Stewart, the historian I mentioned before, has this book, The Compton Effect. He really wrote the book on it. Uh, it's surprisingly compelling reading about the history of uh, the development of X-ray science leading up to it and beyond Compton's work. Bruce Wheaton's The Tiger and the Shark is all about the notion of wave-particle duality, covers the development of those ideas, both theoretically and experimentally, through the 1900s, 1800s, 1900s. Cosmos of Arthur Holly Compton, this is a collection of Compton's writings. It's where he talks about his triplane and so forth. Uh, and Jose Perillon has this interesting book, Science Between Myth and History, that uh, really points out how scientists, not just physicists, but scientists will tend to mythologize the past holding up certain figures as paragons of, of the field and kind of forgetting about everyone else. It's why I've been trying to mention that Compton was not working alone, working in a vacuum, such as X-ray tubes. Um, there were many others working in the field at the same time. I haven't emphasized those others as much as I can here because I have finite time, but it's a very interesting book to think about how scientists think about themselves. Uh, and also uh, stay tuned. There's an article I'm writing for Physics Today. It's gonna come out in December or maybe January edition. That's essentially all this information fleshed out a bit more. Um, and I want to quickly advertise the three next talks in this series. Next week, Mike Ogilvie will talk on Compton and World War II, the Manhattan Project. Quick note, Mike is off on sabbatical in Seattle, so the talk will be virtual, but we'll have the room open. We'll have the coffee and donuts. You're welcome to come in here and hang out. It's just that Ogilvy himself won't actually be here. He'll be beaming in. Lee Sabatka. Sitting there in the orange, we'll be talking on uh, Arthur Compton's influence on Washington chemistry. Are you going to talk about the banjo? Uh, no, I wasn't planning on it. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Mike Novak sitting in front here will talk on Compton forever. Uh, I believe this is how important the Compton effect remains, especially for modern astrophysics. So that's the topic. And with that, 
Thank you for your attention. I'll take questions. Thank you. You know, you're welcome to come play with all the equipment down here. After I have a question. Oops, sorry, I think. Uh, yeah. Would you violate the certainty of the law without seeing the right to the statute? you got a single photon. Uh, no, we don't know anything specific about the, well, okay, so the uncertainty principle, in order to violate that, you'd have to have really, really, really fine scale measurements of both position. <laughs> the position uh, and the momentum of, say, the outgoing electron, and certainly these measurements, you don't know those nearly well enough. It's hard to get to that level. So it's my naive understanding when the Big Bang happened, there was no flash. And it took 100 or 200 million years for the universe to light up or for there to be light. So how was light created? Was light in that finite, infinitely small area and took a while to become light? Or was it created? How was it created? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, um, yeah, I, um, you know, Big Bang, we don't have very many good measurements of the Big Bang itself. Um, this is also well outside my own personal domain of knowledge uh, from where I do research. Uh, certainly, there was a lot of energy coming out of whatever the Big Bang was that would have produced a lot of light in the beginning, which, which, which people are trying to measure. I'll, I'll talk about that a little yeah. bit in, in three weeks. I Excellent. guess with you can save me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I mean, the cosmic microwave background is the light from the Big Bang, the thermal radiation of, of the universe. And one of the things that we do is look at the distortions of that light by the Compton effect uh, from from the material from the electrons uh, surrounding yeah. clusters of galaxies. Yeah. So that's Called the Sanyaya Zoldovich effect, and we'll we'll talk about that in three weeks. So we'll talk about the light from the Big Bang and how the Compton effect uh, is used to study that light and study clusters of galaxies. Motivation to come back. So the background radiation really warrants light, but not it, any form. It, it, it is. Yeah, it's just that it's been so redshifted from it, it was a much hotter universe, and then. It's 14 billion years of red shaping and expansion of the universe that shifts the microwaves. And then that gets further distorted by the hot gas and clusters of galaxies. So we'll be talking about that in three weeks. Why, why did Compton come here 100 years ago? I'm sure he could have gone to many other places. Yeah. How did he choose Wall Street? He could have. So he actually said a bit more, other than saying this is a little, you know, a little out of the way place. The reason he chose to come here is at least according to what he wrote down in his essays, is that he wanted to be away from the contemporary currents of thought. He didn't want to be hanging out with people who had other ideas about what was going on. He had these particular ideas for how to understand the X-ray problem, and he wanted to be alone to work on the problem. He was alone here hundred years ago. There were a few people in the department who actually closely collaborated with a fellow uh, uh, Johnsey, George Johnsey, I think, who was here at the time. But if you look at his papers, virtually all of them are solo author. It was him down in his lab measuring stuff. That picture of the quantum scattering, you know, incoming X-ray, outgoing X-ray, and electron. Uh, apparently, the first time he showed that publicly was in his physics class he was teaching. He said, "Hey guys, look what I found." <laughs> Pretty cool. <laughs> Just one slight correction from the very beginning to talk the Chicago pile coming and so on. Wasn't shipped to us in Alamos, Oak Ridge. I'm a native of Oak Ridge. That's where the big reactor was built. In. And yeah. Hanford. No, Oak Ridge. Well, first. Oak Ridge and then Hanford. Yeah. yeah, but Oak Ridge was the first continuously operating reactor in the center of the Manhattan Project. Can you repeat the questions or the comments? Oh, here. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's just a little side thing. <laughs> yeah. It's also, from earlier in the talk, um, there was a picture of the three brothers mm -hmm. and presumably two sisters. Oh, oh yeah, one. sorry, I actually meant to mention that. One sister and mother. Sister and mom. Sister and mom. The sister Marie did not become a scientist. They were a strongly Presbyterian family. So the question was about 
the rest of the people in that picture of the family. Um, uh, she, yeah, so they were strongly Presbyterian family. She entered the ministry and spent much of her life overseas in India. Often would visit her there. So he, he actually was involved in a lot of this and had a lot of his writings are on religious matters and how that influenced his, his physical views. And um, on his wish to come here to be separated from, from the uh, Orthodox community, uh, uh, a long time ago, one of the uh, uh, commencement speeches was given by Barbara Tuckman, who emphasized discovery. <laughs> and, uh, and that was a theme from that, that particular, that parallels the, I, the motivation to come here. And that's been offered by some of our subsequent chancellors as this is an arena for, for discovery. Yeah. I think it's I, I think it's an intriguing idea to like go off and like focus and work on your own. In some cases, it'll work out really well, uh, but you could also uh, how can I put this? believe your own stuff. <laughs> and sometimes this could lead you astray. Like you, you don't want to be too isolated for too long because you can you know you can start believing your own ideas that other people would be like, "You're just crazy, man." <laughs> Might be a trivial question, but is there any reason that all these experiments centered around the use of X rays and not any other kind of radiative light? Um, is there a reason why all these experiments centered on X rays? Um, so they didn't. Uh, yeah. So the, the problem of giving you know just a, a short talk is I'm going to focus on one thing from which this you know remarkable result came. But people were working on all areas of the electromagnetic spectrum. Lots of people, especially so where uh, Compton was when he spent time at Rutherford's lab, most of what Rutherford's lab was doing at the time was focused on gamma rays. Uh, lots of people were, the photoelectric effect was primarily being explored in the visible. Um, and, you know, so people were working across the spectrum. And there was, you know, there was some class of people who chose to work at x-rays because it was interesting, because that's what they knew how to do, because they saw interesting problems they could solve there. But that happened yeah, across the spectrum. So it's just a footnote, but I did my undergraduate work at Davidson, and they had the first x-ray that Remkin took of his hand science building. So you can see the original Remkin up of his hand. Cool. Cool. Brave. <laughs> Actually, his wife's it's hand, but, um, wife's but um, <laughs> so the X-ray tubes at the time and still now emit polychromatic X-rays of varying um, energies. Was he using a filter in front to make it a more monochromatic beam, or or how was that? Um, how how was that? A yeah, good question. Um, was, was using a, a okay? So you get a lot of different X-rays out of a tube was using those or, or just filtering. It depended on the experiment he was doing. So um, the experiments that were, people were doing in the, in the 19 aughts and, and the early teens were largely with uh, a broad spectrum X-ray. So all the colors coming out, um, which actually made a lot, it's probably caused them, <laughs> it's what they had, but it caused them a lot of problems with interpretation because they would scatter light off and then they would see different intensities at different angles and they characterized things largely in terms of what they called hardness. Hardness was the penetrating ability of x rays through a material. So you take them, you know, you'd shine x rays, all your beam of x rays through, and you'd measure the total amount that came out here without necessarily paying attention to the spectrum so much. Um, or if you did, you get you can tell the difference between high energy and low energy. So some source of X-rays would have more penetrating radiation, which was presumably higher energy. Uh, as time went on and techniques got better, they had more and more monochromatic sources. I mentioned that fellow Varkla, who won a Nobel in 1916 for discovering the characteristic the, the characteristic radiation of X-rays from a material. Idea is you shine some high energy x-rays on a material and you get particular bright beams at a narrow range of wavelengths coming out of it. People started using that as a more more, more and more monochromatic source of x-rays. You could get an even better monochromatic source by doing this Bragg spectroscopy thing of bouncing a bunch of x-rays off of a crystal and finding that particular wavelengths went in different directions. 
And then you could just you could filter everything else out with lead, leave a little slit, and just choose the monochromatic beam. So there were a range of techniques, and it depended on what you wanted to do. Radiologists, I remember over 50 years ago when I was a resident, that I went to places that we were still, I was right over the we had to do dark adaptation with dogs. Glasses over our eyes that we could, and we were sitting right over the X ray tube. <laughs> and I went to places where we took the films and were dunking them in big barrels. And then they would hold them up for me like that to read them. <laughs> I mean, this is in my lifetime. <laughs> and certainly, radi a lot of screening. And, and there were some radiologists that lost the tips of their fingers due to the radiation because we were sitting right over the ah. X ray tube. Probably what he only lost for tips. So I mean, I, I've seen a remarkable changes. <laughs> Just an interesting aside. My wife's grandfather was a physician in Hamilton, Ohio, and a six-year-old kid swallowed a nail. So he was doing X-rays to follow the nail through the GI tract to see if it was going to perforate the stomach or get. And he did X-rays, and he published a paper in the late 1920s. In 1919, in the Journal of Reconography, this male tract of the Yeah. Nice. First, does Compton bounce his ideas off of anyone? Yeah. Uh, people working here, yes. And in his papers are acknowledgments to some of the other faculty in the department at the time. Did he just do anything else with his brother? It was an excellent. Um, not that I'm aware of. I know they published one paper together. Uh, sorry, Chris, was, they didn't do anything else with his brother. Um, so far as I know, he had to publish the one paper on the, uh, the four quadrant of atometer improvements. So if you'd like to see any equipment down here or play with it, you're welcome to come down. I'll take any other questions you have. If you have donuts, please help yourself. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the first time I saw it, I knew it. The first time I saw it, I knew it. The first time I saw it, I knew it. The first time I saw it, I knew it. The first time I saw it, I knew